Okay, that's all I have to say. Um, let's start with going back to this second wave equation. So we're now on lecture 26. Lecture 26, wave equation 2. And in this lecture, we're going to cover how to solve for the solution of the wave equation for the case of a plucked string. So it's a, it's a nice, interesting, intuitive example of wave motion. And then we'll, I think we'll go and look at some, one of the question one from the problem set number nine. Okay, let me recap what we did last time. So we wrote down the wave equation, which has been left here. This is the wave equation, which is different from the heat equation. You have two time derivatives in the displacement u, the vertical displacement from the axis. This is for a string of length l. And because these are two time derivatives, instead of one time derivative for the heat equation, um, you need two initial conditions in time. You need to specify the initial displacement of the string, and then you need to specify the initial velocity of the string. And then finally, this is a situation where you're considering just the simplest boundary conditions possible. These are Dirichlet boundary conditions, zero Dirichlet boundary. And you remember that you always should check that whether this is zero or non-zero. If it's non-zero, then you may need to obtain a steady state solution in the case of the heat equation or some other method. Um, and then what we did was we did the separation of variables technique for this equation, and we applied the boundary conditions, these two conditions, and we were about to develop the coefficients, the an and the bn, for the two initial conditions in time. And that's where we ended up with the last lecture. Let's write down the Fourier series solution before we apply the um, two initial conditions. We'll apply them get the formula for them, and then apply them to a very specific case of the plucked string. Okay, so um, the Fourier series solution that we developed last time was u of xp equal to the sum, I hope I remember this right, I think it was from one to infinity of the uh, variation at x, which is described by a sign, is n pi x over l, okay? And then it was multiplied by um, a, a sine and a cosine. So we said this was an an times a cosine of n pi x, uh, you know, n pi ct over l. Okay? And then a bn with a sine the same um, input. This should say sine of n pi ct over l. Okay, so this satisfies the two boundary conditions. The eigenvalue, the lambda in this case, was specifically chosen to satisfy the boundary condition on the right, and then the boundary condition on the left is automatically satisfied by the fact that sine of zero is zero. So now we just have to apply those two initial conditions. So we have the initial condition of uh, u of x and zero being u naught of x, Okay, and then you substitute this in here. Um, when t is equal to zero, the sign disappears, leaving you with a n. Yeah, okay, that's right. It's a bit confused for a second. Uh, leaving you with a n, but then the cosine here is one, essentially. So this is just a sign of n pi x over l times a n, and I'll write it out here. And then you have a cosine of zero, which is one, so this goes from one to infinity. Okay. So now, um, this u of x function is something that you specify, it's being specified on the, on the right from zero to l. Okay, so let's just draw, draw a picture there. So you remember that the initial displacement of the string, so for instance, I'll draw the example that we'll, we'll do. So suppose I gave you the initial displacement looking like this. So this is the example of a plucked string. So this is my uh, u naught of x. Okay, and then to compute the Fourier series of this using a, um, a sine series, then you remember that you want to form the odd extension of the function. So you extend it to the left here in the odd way. This is minus l, and so this Together, these two together give you u odd of x. You can't see that, it's just u odd of x, or u o of x, sometimes we call that. Okay, so once you've done that extension, then the 
So you, you say let's extend to uh, minus LL uh, via the odd expansion. Okay, and then this forms your 2L periodic function, 2L periodic function, and then now your AN coefficients um, are going to be given by the, you double the Fourier series, and then you integrate it from 0 to L, and then this is just a U naught of X times the sine of N pi X over L dx. Okay, that's it. Okay, so that's all very standard, and then now you have the um, you have the initial condition for the initial velocity. Right. So I'd really like not to um, go down so low. I'm gonna. I will. Okay, I'll keep this. I'll just have to kneel down. Right. So I've got my initial condition of u of um, ut of x and 0 being v naught of x, okay? And then so you have to go and take a derivative, a time derivative of this formula here. And when you notice when you take the time derivative, then you'll get the factor of n pi c over l coming out from each of these sinusoidals, and then the cosine switches to a minus sine, the sine switches to a cosine, and then when you apply the t is equal to zero condition, the cosine is switched to a sine, and then sine of zero is zero. So you're left with this coefficient only. Okay, so when you substitute in x equal, t is equal to zero from here, you will have the series, the sine series, from one to infinity of sine of n pi x over l, okay, and then multiplied by, um, Vn here times the factor in front, so we'll write the factor in front, this will be an n pi c over L times the Bn, and then this will have become a cosine of zero. I'll write that cosine of zero, uh, which will just be one. Okay, so I skipped the step where the, the cosine changes to a sine and then you substitute in t is equal to zero. Okay, so now um, that's basically it. We can clean this up a little bit. Let's rewrite this as let's rewrite this as little b n times sine of n pi x over l from one to infinity. Okay, so I've I've just called this thing here, little bn. Okay, and now you have the same um, you have the same method that you're going to form the odd extension of v naught, and you get a formula for bn which is identical to the formula for an with this u naught being replaced by v naught. Okay, that's basically it. So um, let's. Let's erase this. I'd like to leave this AM here. It's going to be a bit out of order. Okay. okay. So from this line here, you'll conclude that BN, which you know is this quantity n pi c over L times capital BN is equal to this quantity here, a 2 over L, the integral from 0 to L of, now this is replaced with a V naught of X, times the sine of N pi X over L dx, like that, okay? All right. So um, then you move this over to the other side. So let's do that now. We're going to be a bit messy here. Let's move this over to the other side and then erase uh, the bn here. So this becomes an L over n pi c. So this becomes a bn is equal to L over n pi c, like so, like so. Okay, and that's it.
So we have our, our final result. We have got our Fourier series. We've got the coefficients Bn. We've got the coefficients An. Notice, by the way, that Bn, when I was doing this before, I noticed that, well, the, the Ls cancel, right? So it's a, it tells you that the coefficients Bn are somewhat independent. This prefactor is a bit independent of L, but I don't know whether that's significant or not. Um, and that's, that's essentially it. So now let's, let's apply that to the example of the pluck string. Okay. Uh, well, I don't think we have a choice. I think we have to erase this. So we'll try to remember it. L over n pi c, 2 over L, and then this integral. Um, and for the case of the pluck string, the bn will turn out to be 0. I'd like to just uh, find the exact reference in the notes where the pluck string is done. So this is going to be example 16.4 from the notes. Okay, and the example is essentially saying solve the wave equation with the, these two um, with with zero Dirichlet so zero Dirichlet just means that the boundary conditions are held to be zero at the other end so you're, you're holding your, your string fixed and uh, I'm going to specify an initial velocity so u naught of x initial displacement and initial velocity and the form of this is going to be x from um, 0 to pi by 2. And it's going to be uh, pi minus x uh, when it's between pi by 2 and pi. OK? And then v naught of x is equal to 0. And the domain is uh, 0 to L. Here, L is equal to pi. OK? So this is indeed the, 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 the situation of a, let's just draw the picture. So that's 0. Here, L is equal to pi. And you just make sure, so when x is equal to pi by 2, the height here is at pi by 2. So it's linear. It's 0 on the left goes up to pi by 2 at the midpoint, like this. And then when x is equal to pi by 2, the right-hand side here is also equal to pi by 2. And when x is equal to pi, it's equal to 0. So this comes back down like that. This has a height of pi by 2. And you, um, you pull the string up with this initial displacement, and then you let it go with initial velocity of 0. So you just hold it stationary, and you let it go. And we're interested in the evolution of this string. Um, right, so all we have to do, so here, the solution is uh, u of xt is equal to the Fourier series. I'd rather not write it out again, just because I'll run out of board space, is uh, the previous Fourier series. And I should say, by the way, that if, 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 if this was an old exam, it was the way you were assessing previously, I would never, we would never give a question like this on the exam where you're expected to memorize the formula. We, we'd always want you to derive it from scratch. Um, and I think that's a good policy. I don't think you should go and memorize your Fourier series formula. You should memorize the, the basic Fourier series, you know, your n pi x over l combinations. Um, but you shouldn't memorize that the solution of these zero Dirichlet problems with this initial displacement, this initial velocity is given by the thing that we wrote down. Um, you always want to be able to just derive it from scratch when, when you need it. So in this case, we've got your two coefficients, your an and your bn. And the bn 
here, which was 2 over L times, oh boy, uh, n, L over n pi c, I think, the integral from 0 to L, in this case, it's 0 times sine of n pi x over L dx is equal to 0. If any of you notice, I've made a mistake here. Um, with what you remember, just let me know. Uh, so here, L is equal to pi, and this is equal to zero, so you, you don't need any of those coefficients, and you only need the an bits. So this is the thing that we have to compute, um, and we're going to probably need more space than what we have here, but we'll, we'll get started. So this is going to be 2 over L, and L is pi. It integral from zero to pi of this function here, and I have to split it up into the two bits from zero to pi by two, and then from pi by two on, onwards. So um, it's going to require a, a bit of work with your integration by parts. Um, I'd really like to do this, well, with as much space as possible, but I don't think I have a choice. I'm integrate from 0 to pi by 2 with x times your sine function. Uh, and this is n pi x over L, but L is equal to pi, so this is just n times x like this. And then you have to add the secondary bit plus the integral from pi by 2 to pi of, of uh, that quantity, pi minus x, times sine of the same quantity, nx dx. OK. Right, now is there a trick to doing this? So um, I haven't done the question before, so let's see. So, there are some possible tricks. You could try to do a coordinate substitution here to flip it so that this becomes uh, this becomes an x, but I don't think that's going to work. You can also expand this to be pi times sine minus x times sine. But I don't think that's going to simplify your life either. I think the way I would do it, well, the way I'm going to try it right now is I'm just going to do an integration by parts with both of them, with both of them individually. Um, I'm not sure whether there's a neat trick to doing the computation in one go. Okay, so let's call this integral i1, let's call this integral i2, and let's just do each one separately. And I know what the final answer is, but I don't know how to get there, so we have to both work at it. Let's see. Okay, so I1 will be 2 over pi times the integral from 0 to pi of x times sine of nx dx. Okay, so you have to do your standard integration by parts. You'll get let u be equal to x, let your dv equal to sine of a, a nx dx. So this is a, a 2 over pi u times v. So we need x, and then we need the integral of the sine uh, function. So that I think this is a one, minus 1 over n times a cosine of n times x. If we've, done, if we've done that right, I can differentiate this, and I get sine of nx, which appears to be the case. 0 to pi, and then you have to add that because of the minus there. That's a 1 over n, and then I have the derivative of the x function, which is a 1 times the cosine of nx dx. And this is not to pi, it's to pi by 2. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. when, I, when, when I corrected that mistake, I said, I'm going to turn around and see how many people point out this way. But I managed to correct it myself. <laughs> okay. So um, I'm going to integrate this to become a sine, and there's going to be no simplification. So usually this goes from 0 to pi. It, if it does go from 0 to pi, I don't have to integrate it right away, because I know sine of 0 is 0 and sine of pi is of n times pi is 0. Um, but in this case, because this goes to pi by 2, I do need to integrate it. Um, let's put in the limits here. So the limit on the 0 n is 0, which leaves us only with the limit on the n by 2 n. So this is a 2 over pi. Okay, so then this is going to be a minus 1 over n times the x, which is a pi by 2, 
times the cosine of n pi by 2 like this. Okay. And then this is going to be a plus. Okay, so now you have to integrate this function here. I think it's a 1 over n squared times the sine of nx like this from 0 to pi by 2, like so. Yeah, that's right. I'm still just doing this first integral. Is that okay? Hopefully it's all right. Okay, so um, now I'd like to simplify this eventually, n pi by 2. So the cosine being multiples of pi by 2 uh, will either be 0 or 1 or minus 1, right? depending on whether when you're on the unit circle. So if n is 0, for instance, then it's 1. If n is 1, then the cosine is 0, and so forth and so on. So there's, a, there's, a, um, there's an even and odd um, simplification here. And the sine on the 0 n will be 0, and the sine by the pi by 2 n will be something else as well. So let's just simplify everything. So we have 2 over pi, the integral from, uh, I think we have to leave this. I don't think we can do anything with this for the moment. I think we should leave this cos of n pi by 2. And then we'll just stick this in here. So this is a plus 1 over n squared, and then a sine of n pi by 2. Have I done that right? I guess so. They meant pi by 2 in the limit of the first integral. Yeah, sorry. This, this, that's right. There we go. Yeah? Okay, now... I'm not quite sure what to do with this in the end, because, because I know that the solution simplifies with something quite nice, nice, nice and elegant, but let's leave this for now. Let's go on to the integration of I2. So I'm curious whether the integration of I2 here produces a term that cancels one of these. So the, the, the procedure to integrate I2 is going to be very similar to the procedure to integrate I1 here. The only difference is that the integration by parts you're going to apply to a pi minus x instead of an x. So let's write that here. So I2 will be 2 over pi. And uh, should we try to be ambitious and just do it with this line here? We're not going to rewrite it um, here. So the u will be pi minus x. They meant pi by 2. Cos of n pi by 2 is equal to 0. No, not quite, right? Because if n is equal to 0, so the question is, is cosine, so does that simplify here? Question mark. Well, when n is equal to 0, this is equal to 1. So you have cosine of 0 is 1. If n is equal to pi by 2, this is cosine of pi by 2, which is 0. And then you see it's going to go, the, the next one will be minus 1, and then the next one will be 0, and then 1 and 0. So it's going to go in that order. So it's not quite as simple as saying. Um, so you, you, you're, you're going to have to basically do it an even and odd split to, to simplify this. But I want to write, I want to do this one here because I, I, I do wonder whether there's going to be a similar factor to one of these two that will cancel um, when you do this integral. Does that make sense? So uh, you let u be equal to the pi minus x, you let your dv equal to the sine of nx. So this factor will be the same. The only difference is that this x is replaced with a pi minus x, the pi minus x, and then you have a minus 1 over n times the cosine of nx like this. And then this integrate from pi by 2 to pi, do that right. And then you'll have a plus 1 over n, cosine of nx factor, and then the derivative of this function here, which is a minus 1. So it's going to be identical to this. The only difference is that instead of the uh, 1 times cosine of nx here, it looks like we have a minus 1 times cosine of nx. Okay, so this is going to be a plus 1 over n times the integral from pi by 2 to pi. Uh, 
of minus 1 times cosine of nx dx, like that. I'm getting a little bit nervous because I haven't done this computation before, so I'm not sure whether it's going to work out. If it doesn't work out, we're going to be in a bit of trouble because uh, finding the mistake is going to be a bit hard. But. Okay, so we're going to substitute in pi into this end, and it disappears, and we substitute pi by 2 into this end as well, and you get something. And that's why I was a little bit hopeful that the cosine of n pi uh, over 2 will repeat. You'll integrate this function here, you have a sine, and similarly you plug in the two limits, and it should disappear at the rightmost limit and not disappear at the left limit there. Okay? Alright, so let's do it. So we have a 2 over pi. You substitute in the pi into this n, you get 0, and then you have to subtract the negative of this one here. So you have to subtract this one here. So this will be a pi by 2. When you multiply, when you subtract this one, it becomes a positive. This is going to be a 1 over n times a cosine of n pi uh, over 2, like that. You have to watch closely and let me know if I made a mistake. And then this is going to be a, um, a minus because of the, the negative sign here. Then you integrate the cosine, you get a sine, but the sine is kept. So you minus 1 over n squared times a sine of nx from pi by 2 to pi, like so. Okay, and then you close your bracket. Okay, so it should be identical to this one here, except it's a negative. That's right. Okay, now then you substitute the pi into this sine of nx function that disappears because sine of a multiple of pi is zero, and then you have negative, let's clarify this so we don't get mixed up, this is a pi by 2, and that's a minus in front here. You substitute the pi by 2 into this end here, and then this turns into a plus. So it looks like you're going to have a 2 by pi, going to have a pi over 2n times a cosine of n pi by 2. And then this will turn into a plus because it's on the left limit. And then it's a sine of that n pi by 2 factor. All right. No one's flagged anything yet. OK. Right, so now the question is, so this is I1. The question is, if I add these two together, yeah? Nice. So I see that if I add them together, this negative uh, pi by 2 n cosine will kill this positive version. Yep, it'll kill it exactly. Um, negative plus the positive bit. And... And, and, and that's a plus. Okay, good. So the sign here doesn't kill that one. So you, you double up on the sign. So it looks like you do get something. Um, you don't, someone has flagged up an issue. I don't get why the minus sign changes in the first term. Which line in the first term are you referring to? So you have to tell me line one, two, three, four, five, or six. Line six. So are you referring to this? Um, are you referring to the transformation of this term to, to this one here? The minus one over n, this one here. So let's just check. OK, I, I put pi into this left hand side and left factor and I get zero. And then I put pi by 2 into the left factor. This factor becomes pi by 2. Pi minus pi by 2 is pi by 2. And then I have to take, I have a negative because the left limit times a minus 1 over n. So I think it's right, right? So if you substitute in pi, I'm going to do, uh, I'll do it up here, yeah? So you substitute in pi, you get 0 times stuff, which doesn't matter, minus and then this is a pi minus pi by 2, so that's a pi by 2 times a minus 1 over n times the cosine of stuff. So then this negative times a negative, 
gets you the positive there. Okay, good. Tonight. We should just uh, lecture by chat always. I think it's a good idea. Just continue to do it. Okay, so, um, right, so at the end of the day, it looks like this factor here with the cosine cancel with this factor once you add the i1 and the i2 together, and then this factor of the sine adds this factor of the sine, and you double up. Okay, so at the end of the day, I'm going to erase this one here. At the end of the day, this was your an coefficient, coefficients, I think. It looks like you have a 2 over pi. And then you just double up this factor here because there are two of them. So you have a 2 over n squared times the sine of n pi over 2, like this. All right? Okay. And uh, again, if you're suspicious of anything, we're, we're all doing this together. So if you're suspicious of anything, let me know. I could have just as easily made a mistake. Okay, and then uh, that's basically it. So this is a 4 over n squared times pi times the sine of n pi over 2. Now, I think when I uh, wrote the lecture notes, or I wrote the typeset notes, this might not be simplified even further. You could simplify it, but there's not really a great point. It isn't, so I've just looked at the notes now. Um, this is left as it is. If you did want to simplify it, then you have to basically set your n be either equal to 2k, and you, and you look at what happens on all the even elements, and you notice when n is equal to 2k, this becomes k times pi, so they all disappear. And you, and you also set n is equal to 2k plus 1. And then that cycles you through all the odd elements, and you notice that on the odd elements, um, it's equal to either 1 or minus 1. But... I don't think I bothered. Let's try doing it anyways, just out of curiosity's sake. And then we get an even simpler formula. Um, so let's try. So uh, if n is equal to 2k, right, then you have sine, uh, you have sine of, of uh, 2k pi over 2. So that's k times pi. So this is equal to 0. So this tells you that a n is equal to zero if n is even. Okay. Um, alternatively, if n is equal to two k plus one, then your a n is four over two k plus one squared times pi times the sine of 2k plus 1 times pi over 2, like that. Okay, and then you have to go and figure out what the heck this is here. Um, and if you don't know, you just put in, you start putting in numbers. So if k is equal to 0, I have sine of, and you notice if k is equal to 0, you have sine of, of pi by 2, which is 1. If k is equal to 1, then you have sine of of 3 pi by 2, which is minus 1, and so forth and so on. So it looks like basically it's equal to minus 1 to the k, yeah? Minus 1 to the k. So you can simplify this to 4 times minus 1 to the k over 2k plus 1 squared times pi. Okay? And so by doing this, you kind of ensure that when you compute your ANs, if you didn't do this, when you compute the ANs, you get a lot of zeros, you get zeros every uh, second element. Um, if you do it with the K index instead of the N index, then you'll get non-zeros um, for all of the elements. Okay? That's basically it. So let's now, I haven't done the code yet, but I want to code it together with you if you don't mind. Uh, let's try to plot this and just see what it looks like. Okay? Right, so I have to share my screen, firstly. Should it be AK? Well, yeah, that's right. So this, um, 
this will be, it's still a n with n is equal to 2k plus 1, but then you can rewrite that as an a k if you like. So this will still be a of uh, 2k plus 1, and if I like, I can rewrite this as, let's say, a tilde k, just re-index it by k. Okay, and then the final result will be, um, boy, let's see, mu of x t is equal to the sum of sine of n uh, of n x, sorry, it's usually n n pi x over l, from one to infinity, and then we've got our a n's. Um, oh, I see. Okay, I see. I see. So if I, I could go and replace this with. Uh, uh, I have to do it two lines now. So this is an cosine of of uh, n c t like that. Okay, and then if you want, you can now go and replace n with two k plus one, and then put this into here, and then just start k at uh, k equal to zero. Okay, so let's let's do that here. I have to cram it in a little bit. Uh, I don't want to cram it in. Okay, this k is equal to zero to infinity. This is going to be a sine of two k plus one. Times an a k. So this will now be our a tilde k. Where a tilde k is this thing here. And then you multiply that with a cosine of two k plus one c p. And C is just a constant that you've chosen, and you might not be able to see that because it's being hidden by the time. Okay, so you're free when you when you put this on your computer and try to plot it. You're free to use whichever formula you like. This is obviously the more efficient formula because every um, k here is assured to be non-zero. Um, whereas if you compute it here, when you compute the ans, you'll be getting zeros for every two elements. So let's try. Well, we'll try this one, and hopefully we don't we haven't screwed up the formula. Okay. In the notes, just to remind you, in the notes, I don't we don't end up uh, concluding with this version of the formula. It doesn't matter in the end. Um, unless the question asks you, can you simplify it down to its base, you know, its, its most simple form? You're free to leave it as this if you like. Okay. So here we are. Let's see. So this was my old codes. I'm going to just save a version of this so that it works for next year. Let's call this wave plucked. Um, and sure, why, why don't we just code it together from scratch? Okay, so uh, let's always good policy to clear and close all your figure windows. Um, so that, that way you just start fresh. And they do it three pluck string. The reason why you clear it, by the way, why it's a good policy is that sometimes you end up reusing old variables that you've set to something and you forget that you actually set the variable value at some point. So, um, and that you run to errors that way. So always good policy to clear and close everything. Okay, now, um, what do we want to do? Well, we want to plot over a domain in X. So we have to make a series of points and uh, it goes from zero to pi, and let's just use, say, 100 points, okay? And then we also eventually want to use time as well in all of this. I should have really used the old code, but I'm, um, and I'm, I'm, let's set your, your way speed to be equal to one, okay? And if you look at the, um, if you look at the, the form of the time term, it's a cosine, it's a cosine of uh, nct, and so if c is equal to 1, the period there is 2 pi, okay? So let's just double up with this period. Let's, let's do two periods, 2 times pi, like this. If you didn't know this, then you just set your maximum time to be whatever you, you want to be, um, and, then, and then you can just adjust it afterwards. Let's, let's do, use 100 points as well. Okay, now um, the next thing we need is we need to design a function which is going to spit out those coefficients that we chose before. So we're going to um, 
let's write a function that's going to compute the entire, th let, okay, let, let's first write a function that's going to compute the a values, okay? So this will be a, let's call this a func, and it's going to take in k values, so you, you do this notation here, and it's going to, going to be 4 times minus 1 to the k over 2 times k plus 1 squared, Um, and then we'll do a bracket here, and then this is multiplied by a pi. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is I, I just want to form um, another function that will compute the general term of the series, so each individual term. So let's call that s. Let's call that s func. And, well, it's actually un, isn't it? Let's call that un, un func. Mm, let's just call it un. And this is going to take in an x, a t, and a k value, like this. And it's going to take the sign. You have the odd signs, 2 times k plus 1 times x, like this. And then it has to multiply it by the a values, that a func of k, like this. And then you have to multiply that by the cosine values. So this is going to be a 2 times k plus 1 um, times c, which is 1 in this case, times t, like that. Okay? This is what's known as an inline function if you've not learned this notation before. This just says create a function which takes in an input of k. Um, and so if I run this, I'm assuming that you've kind of forgotten your, some of your MATLAB, but let, let me run this, and if I look at the workspace here, um, you see I have an a func, which is my function, and if, if I put in, for example, 0, I'll get a value. If I put in 1, I'll get another value, and so forth and so on. So these are just, they take inputs. Um, what's the advantage of an inline function? So you, so first of all, you didn't have to do this. You could have just assigned scalars to each k. So you'd make a little loop that goes through all the different k values and you set them in here. So by first of all, by writing the function, you can just call it with with the relevant inputs. It cleans the code up a little bit. Um, now, when you write function files in MATLAB, you have two choices. You can either create a function file itself. So I could have created a new file and I say function a is equal to a func here, and then it takes in the k value, and then you save this as a separate value, which is called, um, th and that's perfectly fine. Um, or you can create it in line like this, and the reason why you create it in line is that if the function is sufficiently simple, you don't have to set up the separate file for it. You could just um, create it in the same script here. If the function is something much more complicated that requires many lines of code, then you might want to create a separate uh, function file for that. Okay. So now I've done that, um, I'm going to now scroll through for different values of t, I just want to plot the solution. And before I do that, I have to decide how many modes I want to create. So let's call n, let's call nk, the total number of modes here. And let's just say you're going to use 30 modes. Sometimes I don't want to go too high with this just because I want to see what it looks like. If you go very, very high, then it should look really, really good. Sometimes it's good to see it when it doesn't look so good so you can anticipate what the, um, what the convergence rate of the Fourier series is like. How eventually, um, do you need 30 or do you need 100 or do you need 1,000? It, it sort of depends on the properties of the function. So we set it to be something that's reasonable here. Even do 20 as well. Okay, so now you, you want to loop through um, all the different times. So we're going to make a little loop here that runs from 1 to the length of the time vector. And it's going to set a current time value, which we'll call TT, which is the jth entry. And then for each of these times, you need to go and compute the Fourier series. So the Fourier series, you're going to generically start it from 0. The full stop. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's right. So um, a bit confused why someone asked full stop. So someone has asked why you use a period here, so the, the dot here. Um, and the reason why is it depends on what goes into this function. If you're going to feed in individual scalar values, just single values of x, t, and k, 
then you can replace this with the usual times. It's just a regular multiplication. If you feed in an x, which is itself a vector, so x has, say, in, the, in our case, 100 elements, then you want, this will be a vector, this sine function will be a vector with 100 elements, and this cosine will be a vector with 100 elements, and you want to do a pairwise multiplication. That's why I use the dot. Um, if you didn't do the dot, MATLAB would give you an error and say, uh, you've asked for something that doesn't make any sense. And you can either replace it with a dot, or you can um, feed in uh, uh, you have to loop it over all the uh, possible x's. The other thing which you mentioned is that you have to make sure that you feed in an x, which is a vector in this case, but your t is a scalar. Oh, so that's a very good point, in fact. So um, this t here is one of those things where I, when I realize I, I'm going to have to explain a lot more. So the t here can either be a scalar or it has to be a vector which is on the same dimensions as x, okay? And um, I'm going to replace this with 80 for reasons that I'm not going to bother explaining. Okay, so now you're going to loop over all of the um, k's. So let's run from k is equal to 1 to uh, nk. And notice, by the way, this k is separate from this k. This is, this is an input k of the function. This is just a placeholder. So you're going to say u is equal to the old u plus un, and then I go ahead and feed in my stuff here. If I made a mistake, it's not a big issue. We'll, we'll find out soon enough whether we've made a mistake or not. Let's create a new figure window. And let's plot this. Okay, so you're going to plot x and t. Uh, sorry, x and u. And you can put a draw now command just to make sure it flushes the figure window. That just The draw now just says um, kind of flush the figure window so that you, you see it. And... We might want to put a pause command in here, in fact, because it might run really quickly. Uh, and I probably need to, to set the limits of the axis. Let's just set it to be minus 1 to 1. OK. And because this is going to happen very quickly, I'm going to put in a little stop here, because you won't be able to see it if it does so. So if, it's J, if I'm on the first run, I want to make sure I just pause it so that um, I can adjust the figure window so you can actually see. It's given me a mistake. It, says, it said that the matrix dimensions must agree. And the reason why is because this t here, <laughs> that's why I set this to 80 so I wouldn't make that mistake, you see. Um, the t here should really be a scalar. So I have to do tt, the current time. OK, I've run it. And then it's appeared in the figure window. Here we are. Okay. Now it looks a bit funny. I don't know whether we've made a mistake or, um, or not, but we'll have to check it in a second. So we'll, we'll have to increase the number of modes in a second and see does that actually approach the, the function that we, we want to be feeding in for the initial input. But uh, I'll press the button now and then we'll see it evolve. Okay, here we are. It looks like we might have made a mistake. Ah, I know that where the mistake is. Right? The mistake is basically that your index k here has to start from 0. If you look at the Fourier series that we wrote down on the board behind us, this k should start from 0. So start that from 0. And then hopefully now it looks a lot more. Ah, indeed it does. Here we are. And uh, the limits of the, of the y limits here should run from minus pi by 2 to pi by 2. You remember those were the maximal limits. So I'm going to reset that to be minus pi by 2, pi by 2. Now, if you didn't put this, um, you didn't put this explicit y lim command in here, then what would happen is that the f the figure window rescales every time it plots, and it it wouldn't look um, it wouldn't look as nice. And now we run it. Here we are. So there's our pluck string. So notice that even with uh, twenty modes, only twenty turns of the series, but that's actually uh, something like. I was going to say it's 40. It's 40 terms of the original series. With only 20 terms of this series, um, it looks pretty good, right? So it, it doesn't give you that sharp um, corner, which is supposed to happen at the very end, but you wouldn't have expected that too, because you know the Fourier series converges a little bit more slowly near that point. But now we can run the evolution, and there you go. Okay, so you've held the pluck string at time t is equal to zero, and then you let it go. And um, 
this is how it, it, it evolves. It, it oscillates back and forth and creates a standing wave. This is essentially you know, a, a good model for uh, you know, plucking a guitar string or any other string. Um, you'll notice in, in reality that this corner here, so if I increase the number of modes to say 100, right? Um, it's probably a bit excessive. Let's do 80 instead and run that now. You should see that it's going to get a bit um, better resolve near the cusp, near the corner. Something has happened. Yeah, go here and go there. Okay, so let's run that now. Yeah, it's over here. So with 80 modes, it's become a little bit sharper near this corner, but it's still not perfect. Um, it'll be very slowly convergent, I, I think. So you're going to have to increase your number of modes probably to something very high in order to get something which looks like a corn to visual accuracy. Um, but if you run that, that looks like this. Okay, so th there's a few things I want to point out. Uh, there's a few things I want to point out. Um, the first thing w which, which, which relates to what someone has asked is, does this actually look like a string in real life? Well, it does as long as you're not running it for long enough in time. A real string is going to damp over time, right, due to frictional forces um, with the string itself. And so in reality, you would have to include a model of a wave equation which has some damping, which is eventually going to bring the string to rest, okay? Um, but that's not difficult. You could do that. You could modify the wave equation to include that little damping term and then you'll notice that actually these waves will eventually um, decrease in amplitude in time and then the, the string will be brought to rest. The second thing that you'll, no you'll notice is that this an additional corner, so I'm going to run the simulation again and when I do so I, wanna, I want you to watch this initial point. Okay? What you're going to notice is that this initial corner which is present at the midway point um, between the left and right ends, it's going to split into two discontinuities. One discontinuity will move towards the right, the left, and the other discontinuity will move towards the right. Okay, so let's run it again. Here we are. And as, as we do so, I want you to keep your eye on this point here, and you'll notice that it's going to spawn, this, this, this single discontinuity is going to spawn two discontinuities, one moving left and one moving right. There's the left one. It moves towards the end, and then it moves back towards the center, and then back up again. Okay? This has some important consequences. This is quite an important point that essentially in the wave equation, in the model of the wave equation, what happens is that local properties of the wave will move at a speed c. In this case, c is equal to 1. And what you can check is that this discontinuity will split into one that moves towards the left and one that moves towards the right, each at speed c is equal to 1. That's by property of the wave. This is related to that chapter that uh, we might not cover, which is called d'Alembert's solution of the wave equation, which essentially, instead of solving for the wave equation using these Fourier modes, it's expressing the solution in terms of these left and right traveling waves, okay? Um, I know that I've gone over time, so I want to wrap things up. So let's close this display. We didn't get the nice, we didn't get the nice three-dimensional picture. Last time we had that nice picture in time with the surface. So maybe I'll go away and for tomorrow's I'll, I'll show you that picture um, with the evolution of the string, uh, both in X and in time, but you get to see the surface. Um, so this, this entire lecture was all about kind of just solving it for a particular case, a particular case where you have zero usually conditions, you have an initial condition in, um, in the displacement, but zero initial condition in the, um, zero initial condition in the velocity, the case of a plucked string, and basically the trick is that the Fourier series boils down to just the computation of the ANs, you have to go away and do some, some annoying integration by parts of the ANs, but eventually you get this, and then we implement it. In, in MATLAB. We did not have enough time to get started on the problem set number nine, so this is what we want to do with tomorrow's class. We'll make um, tomorrow's lecture all about problem set number nine and start doing some of those questions that hopefully you're doing as well in your free time. Okay, so um, that's about it for the Thursday lecture. 
Um, I'll see some of you on Friday.